Hey, leaders, I want to thank you for listening and for supporting our important work this past year as we grow to master leadership collectively. And as we close out 2018, here are the top 10 most listened to episodes. We look forward to continuing to add value in 2019. Enjoy. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hi, this is Lily, and today we have the honor of having Dr. Toby Travis with us. The organizational and leadership experience of Toby Travis includes working in senior leadership roles of several international schools, nonprofit ministries, and corporations. As a trainer and speaker, Dr. Travis has assisted schools and universities throughout the U.S. and in many other countries. Toby's formal education includes a bachelor's degree in theology, a master's degree in religious education, and a doctorate in school administration. Within school settings, he has experience as a classroom teacher, professional development coordinator, middle and high school principal, academic director, and the head of schools. He is the creator and presenter of the research-based TrustEd School Leadership Training Modules and the author of the Trust Ed School Leader blog at www.trustedschoolleader.com. Welcome, Dr. Toby Travis. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. We are so happy to have you on our podcast. And as you know, this podcast takes us on a journey to master leadership. And we want to do that today by asking you key questions. So are you ready to pour into our listeners? <laughs> ready to pour. Awesome. Toby, can you tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now? Well, it's been a a long and varied path. I've had worn many hats over the years and really came to education as really almost a second career. So I've got a little bit of background in entertainment. I've got a background in Christian missions. I've got a background in motivational speaking and uh, in training. But really, the common thread, though, through all of that has been education. I've always been passionate about learning and about helping others in their growth and development as well. My life really took a a big turn when I moved to Ecuador. My wife is from Ecuador. And there was my first experience working in an international school environment Mm -hmm. and absolutely was blown away by just what I saw there, the opportunities there, uh, especially influencing uh, an international community. Mm -hmm. My last year at that particular school, I think we had 32 nationalities on campus. If you think about the impact of those kids and what they were learning and interacting with those families, and then many of them would then go back to their home countries and have an impact there. And we had everything from, you know, military kids to uh, business families were there, mission families were there, political families were there. And um, these were the movers and the shakers of tomorrow. And that just uh, jazzed me, you know, as far Mm -hmm. as the opportunity. So there I served as a teacher and then as a middle school coordinator and then as a high school principal and then eventually as an academic director. I then moved on to be head of school for an international American school out on the coast of Ecuador. And most recently, I'm now head of schools here at Desert Christian Schools in Tucson, Arizona. Hmm. Wow, that's a varied path entertainment. You talked about being in corporate world and all of that really feeds into education. You're absolutely right. So thank you so much for sharing that. Now, Toby, how would you describe your leadership style? You know, it's hard to talk about yourself. (laughs) (laughs) I can tell you what my aspirations are. How about that? How's that? Some of my heroes, I love the work that Jim Collins has done. I'm a big fan of his work, and I'm referring specifically to his Good to Great and Good to Great for the Social Sector, you know, must-reads for anybody in educational leadership. And there he talks about the most effective leaders, uh, what he calls the level five leaders. They have two commonalities. One is they are passionate about the vision. 
and so I would say, what kind of a leader am I? I'm, I'm passionate. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you get me talking about what's best for kids, what's best for learning, what is truly transformational and preparing them for their tomorrow, not our past. I can get really passionate about that topic. The other thing, though, that Collins identifies in those level five leaders is that these are also humble people. And really what he's articulating there is they recognize it's not about them. It's about mobilizing a team. It's about benefiting the organization and supporting them. I often, in leadership trainings, I will take the standard organizational chart and challenge school heads and CEOs and boards to flip that chart upside down. You know, typically the board and the head of school are at the top of the chart. I really do see that as backwards. I think our job is foundational. You know, my job is to make my division principals wildly successful. You know, that's right. that's my passion. And then their passion should be to make their teachers and their department coordinators uh, wildly successful. And then our teachers' passion should be to make our kids wildly successful. And it's really that leadership role is you're providing the context, the environment for that to happen and take place. So I would say passionate about education that makes a difference and passionate about seeing others be successful. Wonderful. Now, I'm interested and curious and learning when you challenge these leaders about flipping that chart, what's the initial reaction? (laughs) Uh, Well, I think it varies based on why an individual is in educational leadership. Here's Lily. This is something I do. When I do training sessions, I survey the group. For example, I was just out with University of Pennsylvania, the Delaware Valley there. We had uh, probably close to 100 school administrators in the training in the room. And I said, okay, raise your hand if as a teenager, even as a young adult in college, your career ambition was to be a school administrator. Well, you can guess what happens. <laughs> Nobody raises their hand. Right, right. You know, this wasn't a career track that I chose, but very, very few that got to this level of position as their lifelong dream. Why did we get here? Most of us got here because we either had a really bad experience and we want to fix it. You know, those who are driven in their position of school leadership for those values of, I want to change a culture. I want to create a better experience for kids moving forward and for teachers. They respond well to that vision of being the supportive leader, you know, to that servant leadership model. Those who tend to knee-jerk and push back, I found in conversation, they're really about building a career and building towards a secure retirement. And I want a career and I want a secure retirement as well. But if that's what's driving me, I'm in the wrong business is really what I would say to those individuals. I really encourage you to go work the stock market, go find another area to you know develop if it's all about you. And I don't mean that in necessarily the cold sense, because we do have to think about retirement. We do have to think about our financial future. But if that's what's driving us, it's not really the healthiest thing for the school as an organization. Mm -hmm. And you know, Toby, my experience has been that most leaders don't start off that way. Like, for instance, the ones you're talking about, the ones that are looking to retirement, that are looking to just live it out. You know what I mean? Most didn't start off that way, though. Right, sure. And that's also a frequent conversation that I love to get into with school leaders is, tell me why you're here. What got you here? And Mm. most, if not all, do have a compelling story. Usually it involves, they had a mentor. There was somebody who made a difference in their lives and uh, they want to pass it on. Um, And you're right. Usually the turning towards more of a, well, I'm just here for the duration you know, it comes because they've fought too many battles and the system worked against them. It's one of the reasons why, and I know probably many of your listeners are within the public school environment, and I praise them and I'm thankful for passionate educators and, and educational leaders that are staying in uh, the public school sector. But it's one of the reasons why, you know, I'm in the private sector is because I do have a lot more freedom to do what's best for kids, what's best mm-hmm. for teachers, rather than, you know, what's best for accountability to, you know, the local government. You know, I love the question where you ask, well, why? 
you know, you remind them that they had a why. Yeah. Um, and I think reminding them is important. And this is why I do what I do. Hopefully these conversations can trigger that again and can fan into flame that passion that yeah. they once had. So I really thank you for that. Now, Toby, which quote or quotes about leadership speak to you and why? There's probably a number of them. I think one of the best reads and best leadership books in the last 15 years is The Trust Edge by David Horsager. Now, it's not written for educational leaders. It is a business book, you know, very much like the same audience probably that Jim Collins speaks to. But Horsager talks about trust is not a soft skill. And I really resonate with that because of my background and work and research has been in that area of trusted leadership within schools. And, you know, what you see is it is the number one indicator of successful schools, no matter how you measure it, whether we're talking about student levels of achievement, whether we're talking about engagement in performance-based activities or extracurricular, whether we're talking about a financial bottom line or, or community engagement, when there's high levels of trust, those things are all present. And it doesn't just happen. You know, some people write off trust as the, well, either you've got it or you don't. And the best leaders know that's not true. It's an intentional competency that you develop and you create you know, a pathway for that to happen. And that's why, again, I resonate with Horace Auger's trust is not a soft skill. You know, it's something we need to be very, very intentional about. So another quote would come back to Collins you know, where he talks about priorities. He says, if you have more than two or three priorities, you have none. Right, right. And that really resonates with me because, you know, as a school administrator, you're juggling so many things. There's so many stakeholders from all across the spectrum, you know, are you know, wanting their needs met, and rightfully so. But you really, a big part of the work is identifying, okay, what are our current priorities? What can we do now? And, and staying focused. So I really love, you know, what he talks about. And you referenced the why. Another favorite author is Simon Sinek. Start with why. And it's true. If you can identify the why, you get engagement. You know, we see this with students all the time. We know as educators how important it is to connect the learning to real life. You know, relevance has such an important element. It's because the burning question in every kid's head is, why? You know, right. why do I need to do this? And the same thing is true with school leadership. You know, teachers and parents, they need to know, well, why are we doing? It? And if the why is strong enough, you don't even need a perfect plan. <laughs> you know, you're going to go do it. But if the why isn't strong enough, then you're going to get pushback. You're not going to get engagement. And same thing again with kids. When I'm in a classroom, if I can't create a compelling why for the student as to the learning and the why can't be, you know, you need this to pass the test or you need this to get to the next level. No, it's got to be a compelling why that connects to their life reality. If I want engagement, that's how I'll get it. But that's the hard work. You got to find the why. Start with why. So there's another favorite quote. Great. Now, a whole bunch of things came up for me as you were talking. One of them is that you said trust is not a soft skill. And I hate that term soft skill because, you know, it refers to social emotional skills. And quite frankly, those are the hardest to develop. If we don't do it intentionally. So one of the reasons I connected with you or I was attracted to your work and what you are doing is that you lay a foundation and you believe that trust is incredibly important in educational leadership, in leadership, period. Can you tell us a bit about what you do in that work? Well, as I said earlier, it is the number one indicator of a healthy school, and it must be intentionally addressed. And it takes time. That's the other element here. You know, people want to come in and turn a school around. Well, that doesn't happen in a few months. That happens in years because it takes time to develop that level of trust. There's a great work that was done by Marzano, Bob Marzano and his team, and they did a meta-analysis of every piece of school leadership research that was conducted from, I think, 1970 to the early 2000s. So it took them a long time to do this meta-analysis, but out of that appeared 21 key responsibilities of school leaders that had a direct correlation to student achievement levels. And what I saw in my work, and every one of them, is an issue of trust. 
(laughs) that if you don't have the foundation of trust within those responsibilities, it's not going to happen. It's going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. And so what I talk about in the the trainings that I do and what I've labeled trust ed, actually a a friend of mine labeled it that for me. He says, you're doing trust ed. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) That is, well, how do we intentionally develop trust in each of these areas so that we are seeing success in communicating with stakeholders and getting their engagement, ensuring that there's continual development going on at the individual level for every teacher. And it's hard to encapsulate that in just a few words, I guess, Lily, but well, here's the bottom line. It's all about relationships. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's our work, it's our business, but it really all comes down to relationships. You know, somebody who says teachers are my highest value, but has not fought to meet their needs as professionals. Mm, No, it's not true. They're not going to trust you. You need to be the teacher's champion. In so many schools, it's so sad. There's such an adversarial role between school leadership administration and the teachers. And that's so unfortunate because the best schools are where that school administrator, again, is the champion of the teachers. So it's all about building solid relationships, deep levels of trust, and then things get faster. I don't know if you've ever heard of Bob Beal, but he does some great training and he has one illustration where he talks about you own this really souped up powerful sports car. You know, you've got 450 horses under the hood. I mean, this thing is a machine, but you can fly down a hill into a valley and it's full of fog. Well, what are you going to do? You got to stop. You got to slow down significantly. And it's frustrating because you got all this power and you want to go, but you can't go until the fog clears. Well, that's like taking the time to build trust. It's clearing the fog because once the fog is cleared and you've got those relationships built, zoom. Now we can talk about school turnaround, but that's the hard work is the relationship building. (laughs) Once that's done, then you can speed through and take care of curriculum and instruction issues and assessment issues and facility issues. All of that goes so much faster when you've got strong, trusted relationships. Now, do you find that sometimes it's scary or people are, are too afraid to walk into this space and really develop trust? Yeah, certainly, certainly, because you got to be transparent. Mm. I frequently have the conversation and the reminder right down to my own secretary and as well as, you know, leaders on my team is hold me accountable. Mm. I give you permission to hold me accountable. Mm. If you see me doing or saying something that's not in line with what I'm saying publicly, then you call me on the carpet and I will blow it. I'll mess it up. I'm human. And so you've got to be comfortable with letting others hold you accountable and being transparent because we all make mistakes. We all blow it. That's part of building relationships. You know, again, it comes back to quality education. Kids learn through failure. We know that it's how it works. It's what you do with those failures that makes all the difference. So it's the same way in managing a team and and leading a school is okay. You blew it. Own it. Own it. And then move on. And actually that will drive the trust level deeper. If you own it, get transparent about it and move on. Actually, that's an element for building trust. Toby, this is incredibly important work. Now, if our listeners wanted to learn more about this and the work you do, what's the best way to connect with you? I have to thank my wife. A couple of years back, I had finished my doctoral work and I'm like, okay, what do I do with this next? You know how when you're in that season of life, it's you know, it's just all encompassing. And then when it's over, it's over. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, what do I do now? And she goes, oh, you ought to write a blog. And I've read blogs over the years, but I'm like, eh, me, really? And I said, but my audience is so small. It doesn't matter, she said. So I started this blog called trustedschoolleader.com. I mean, my audience is school administrators, you know, so this is a pretty small, narrow group. And because a lot of my work has been in the Christian school market, you know, even some of it is specifically for, you know, Christian school administrators. So, and for some of those in an international setting, so the target gets really small. But the principles are broad, and I've been surprised, uh, I think, you know, thousands and 
of readers. And it's like, wow, how did that happen? And I want to clarify too, Lily, as people listen, I am a full-time head of school here. You know, this isn't a season of life where I'm looking to be a traveling consultant. No, I do accept about a half a dozen opportunities a year to go out and provide trainings and, and all of that. So I'm not selling anything here, but it's a resource that some folks have resonated with and are finding valuable. I developed an assessment piece that you can use as a self-assessment or as a team assessment you know, on trust and then provide and build a trajectory forward on professional development, either as an individual or as a team. How do I then intentionally develop that trust? I created a 10-module leadership training program that is built on, first of all, looking at Again, just the critical nature of trust. But then Dave Horsager, who I mentioned, who wrote The Trust Edge, is a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And he had created, through his research, a model of eight pillars of trust that must be in place for trust to exist. You have to have all eight pillars. And then in my doctoral work, I looked at, okay, well, what does it look like in a school setting? And really a combination of Marzano's work and Horsager's work, I was able then to kind of blend together and find the connecting points to give us an intentional path to build those eight pillars of trust, again, in the specific task and responsibility of school admin. So that's what trust ed is. And so when I do go out and work with schools or work with school administrators, I'm basically helping them assess where are they at as far as their level of trust. And then we identify what are the weaknesses according to those, those various pillars, and then hopefully craft for them an intentional strategy to address those on their team or on their campus. And so that's what Trust Ed is all about. And they can find me again at trustedschoolleader.com to help anyone that I can. I subscribe to your blog. So I get a lot of these and so full of wonderful content. And I was just looking at the first module about a leader who trusts, looks, initiates, stays focused, takes the time, empathizes, is mindful of their nonverbal mm. communication. I mean, just in a few minutes, I got all that. So it's so valuable. Thank you so much for all you do. Oh, thank you. Hey, leaders, stay tuned for the rest of the interview following this brief message. If you haven't downloaded your copy of the Master Leadership Journal, go to masterleadership.org forward slash MLJ to get instant access and begin growing your leadership with questions that have been curated by top level leaders. I've also included some cool extras for you at masterleadership.org forward slash MLJ. Now, Toby, what type of leader are you inspired by and why? I think really what we've already talked about, but I think of several individuals that I've had the opportunity of working with over the years. And, you know, these are leaders who really are mission focused. As we talked about earlier, they are passionate about the mission. It's not just a job. You know, there's more to life than just going to the office and beating it out. They're on a mission to change the world in their part of the world. And that's the kind of leader I like to um, attach myself to. I just finished reading Jimmy Collins' book, which is called Creative Followership. If you're not familiar with Jimmy, he was Truett Cathy's successor at Chick-fil-A. Mm. And he talks about in his book, and it's basically his life story, but he's talking about how he chose his bosses. Maybe he's got one chapter. Oh, I love that. Boss. And how important it is for all of us to identify, yeah, who do we want to follow? Hmm. And, and who and do I, we want to work for or work yeah, with? Yeah, yeah, because it really does shape who we become. And awesome. uh, we all need mentors, and, mm -hmm. and that never ends. And so uh, you have to choose those mentors wisely because you will largely become those who you are a protege to. That's right. Thank you so much for that. Now, what's the best advice you've ever received? Oh, wow. Yeah, best advice was, I think, on priorities. Because I, as you can probably tell, I do tend to be a bit passionate. Life is short. The most important things are people, you know, love people, like things, and that keeping perspective. Although I love my job, I love our school, and I love what I do in helping other schools and other educators, it's not the center of the world for me. Is it my passion? Yes. But the center of the world is those who are closest to me. It's my wife. Right. It's my daughter. It's friends. It's family. Don't get that out of perspective. That needs to remain as highest priority. You're, you're going to end up life very lonely and miserable, even though you may end up very successful in the school world. 
And that great wisdom in that, and probably the best advice I've ever received, and pass it on frequently to others, even my own staff. You know, I tell them, hey, we're on a journey together here that I hope is transformational in the lives of our kids and in our community. But number one, take care of yourself, take care of your relationships. That's really what's most important. You know, I love that as a leader, you're also cognizant of that in the people you lead and you care enough to tell them that, you know, to remember the important thing. What's the important thing? What's the priority? So I appreciate that. Now, I'm assuming you've built many teams. You've been a part of many teams. (laughs) What does it mean to you to have a good team and how do you build or sustain one? It comes back to mission, values, and priorities. First of all, you got to make sure everybody is you know going the same direction as Colin says we're all on the same bus mm-hmm. and that's real important and you got to spend time making sure you know we're articulating that well because often we'll use similar jargon but mean very different things so you have to do the hard work of really unpacking where are we going you know what's our direction and ensuring that everybody really is uh, moving in the same direction you're sailing that ship in a direction that everyone is on board with. The second is values, that you've got agreed on norms of how we're going to do life together as a team. I challenge, you know, all of my teams and their teams that, you know, the first meeting you do of every year, you're talking about norms. You're talking about, okay, how do we agree to do life together? You know, and we talk about our values and that we're going to do life together in a certain way that's respectful of all and in a way that is both professional and personal and understanding. And then, again, it comes back to priorities. And the most effective teams have very clear outcomes. I'm a big believer in ad hoc committees and task force. I'm not a big fan of standing committees because I think they turn into power centers and then they lose their focus of what they were organized to do and the focus ends up being maintaining power. So I'm a big believer in, again, ad hoc committees, put a task force together to solve a problem, solve it, and then dissolve the team and move on. Those are probably the three critical elements for me on team building is shared mission, shared values, shared priorities. Let's get it done. Great. Thank you. Now, can you tell us about a challenge that you've experienced and how it has shaped your life? I think about the transition of coming into formal education. Again, you know, I was in the corporate world, mission world, entertainment world, all those industries. And at the same time, I was doing trainings and I would do seminars and I would do guest speaking and that sort of thing, but not literally in a classroom setting. And when I made that transition into the full-time classroom setting, even though I I had a master's in education, it it was a wake-up call. It was like, (laughs) oh, my word. Nobody teaches like those kids, right? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it's a whole different reality. And I I would say very openly, I I was a miserable failure. That first year of teaching, oh, oh, my goodness. But I've also gone on to counsel others. Never make a career decision in your first year. You know, it's... You've got to plow through that. But I guess where I'm going with this is, again, that willingness, reach out to others, find mentors, look to others for their support and jump in and learn. You know, we talk about the value of lifelong learning and yet so many in education personally give that up. And so I think for me, it was, you know, that willingness to, okay, I got to jump in. I got to learn this anew and seeking out those to help me do it. So I'm so thankful for those who are willing to come alongside me and provide that support and turn a a failure into an eventual success. It didn't happen quick or easy. It uh, takes time. That's great. And as a lifelong learner, what are you learning now? Well, I'm in a new culture. So part of what I'm learning is, you know, every community has its own culture. I've talked about with others and written about it that, you know, one of the first things a school leader should do as he comes into a new community is a sociological inventory, you know, get to know the lay of the land, you know, where's the power, where's the influence, how is news disseminated? And so much of building trust is also building sensitivity to the cultural elements within your community. And even though I know all that, Lily, I'm in a season of life where I'm, okay, we've moved back to the U.S., But this, you know, where we're living, and and we're loving it, Tucson is amazing. It's beautiful. The weather's perfect most of the year round. But it is a unique culture, just like any community. Mm -hmm. And taking the time to learn the culture, to make decisions within a sensitivity of the culture. 
Here was a conversation I was just in recently. We were talking about, we all want to be committed to utilizing best practice and research-based best practice, and I'm a strong proponent of that. But that's always within the caveat of contextualized. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah, we can look at best practice that in most communities, in most situations, this has produced these results. But in the end, you still have to contextualize that best practice to your community, to your setting. Yes. And so really the learning that I'm doing right now and where I'm trying to up my game is in that skill set of contextualization to a unique culture, a unique place and time, because every campus is different. Right. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. And it's funny because as you're speaking about best practice, I certainly can relate to that because sometimes as administrators, as leaders, if we're looking at best practice, we think that you can use the same brush in every culture and every context. You're absolutely right. But there are some times when that doesn't work. And I'll give you a quick example. I used to work in early intervention and a lot of the Latino homes that I would go into you're focused on the child and you're focused on developing that child, but sometimes they will offer you some food. And best yes. practice is typically right. you don't eat. Right, right. <laughs> right? That's best practice. Not right. in a Latino home. Oh, no. <laughs> if you don't eat or at least take a glass of water or something they offer you, then you're automatically creating this barrier between you and the family. So, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, thank yeah. you so much for yeah. sharing that. Toby, what would you tell a new leader? who's discouraged about their working climate or culture? Well, take your time. Uh, get your emotional tank filled someplace else. <laughs> mm-hmm. And what does that mean? How can I do that? Well, again, you know, being careful to protect your heart and protect your emotions. And I know it's hard work, but you do need safe places and safe relationships, you know, whether that's your spouse or a good friend, you know, another professional friend who, you know, is in a similar situation that you can dump on and seek counsel from. I think of a new principal I had. She was first year principal about three months into her first year. And she comes in and closes the door. And I had a little short couch there in the office. And she drops down to the couch, lets out this big sigh. And she says, oh, Toby, when does it end? Mm. And I said, when does what end? And she goes, the problems. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's the job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's what we do. We're problem solvers. And, you know, really, you know, I think she had this idea in her mind that, you know, when she got kind of all the reducts in a row, that everything was going to run smoothly. So, you know, part of my encouragement to young administrators is make sure you know what you're signing up for. Mm -hmm. I want the problems in my office. If I go through a week and no problem has come through my door, I'm probably disconnected from my team. Mm. And, you know, this is where I want problems to land. And if they're not coming to me, then that means there's something probably brewing out there that's not being addressed. So that's what the job's about. And if you can't find your happiness, you know, and if you can't embrace being a problem solver or a change agent, then you're probably in the wrong profession. You know, you really probably need to consider finding your happiness someplace else because schools are wrought with problems. You know, you've got hundreds of kids with hundreds of parents and grandparents, and you've got your faculty and thousands of people in your community. That alone is a recipe for problems, you know, and that is the job. And you have to take pleasure in that and enjoy that. If that stresses you out, then it's probably not a good fit. Mm -hmm. But if you like helping people find solutions, you like working through problem solving, then it's a great career. It's a great job. I agree. Thank you so much. Now, Toby, if there were something you could change in education in the U.S., what would that be? That every school and every educator and every administrator would be empowered and free to truly provide a student-centered learning environment where what we cared about most is the success of every child, regardless of their socioeconomic position, regardless of their learning abilities uh, or weaknesses. We try to do our best to support those with diagnosed needs. You know, we create IEPs or we create 504s. I, I'd love to see us in a world where we create an individualized learning plan for every kid. If there's an ideal, that would be the ideal because we know from the research and we know from experience, no two kids are alike. Right. 
they all have different aspirations. They all have different learning skills and abilities. I was just talking with uh, someone here at the school about rigor. That conversation comes up a lot. And, you know, rigor looks different with every kid. There's no such thing as just saying, well, if we provide AP courses, we're providing rigor. That's not true. <laughs> There's some kids who will blow through AP like it's nothing. That is not rigor for that child. You know, so how you even define a level of rigor looks different for every student. And it's in those learning environments where we see kids really excelling and making a difference in whatever they move on to. Yeah, if I could change one thing, it would be that, that we could all be able to value, again, that individualized student-centered approach to our learning environments. Great, thank you. Now, you have a lot of responsibilities, Toby. What do you do on a daily basis to set your mind? I spend a little time in the Bible every morning and I pray. So that's kind of my centering, if you will, is okay, what's most important? Mm -hmm. And then as I enter the day, I'm a real believer in having and utilizing task management tools that I'm always assessing and reassessing what's the highest priority, what can I get done today or tomorrow? And that can only be a few things. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to continually be prioritizing all the things that are falling on you, but also be able to set timelines for when certain things have to be the priority. I had a buddy of mine who was uh, head of another international school years ago, introduced me to a piece of software called Evernote. That's a wonderful tool for me for organizing my day and my work. And collaborating, right? And collaborating as well, right. Literally, I open up the app or turn on the computer and it tells me what I need to do today. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Now, some days, as you know, it's not a perfect science, but it's a good tool because otherwise you have so many things. Time management skills, task management skills are really critical in school leadership because there are so many different things pulling at you that you've got to be able to prioritize that on a daily basis. You're absolutely right. And many leaders put in long hours. Yes. Yeah. What advice would you have about maintaining balance? Do it. <laughs> yes. And I know those leaders and I've been one of those leaders in the past. And Lily, if you'll allow me to be very, very transparent, I, I lost a marriage over it. You know, you know I, would... I appreciate that. You know why, Toby? Because it happens often. Yeah. I mean, I was go, 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 go. You know, I was not just working all day. I was working half the night and I was on the road and it all seemed good. And then the home front was falling apart when it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. So I adopted a saying, in fact, it was over my desk for a few years. You do what you can do. My wife and I, we adopted a little girl while we were in Ecuador and so I'm being a dad again. Oh. And, um, and I have two grown daughters, beautiful women. And now we've got a six-year-old. <laughs> wow. And I tell myself, okay, I have got to go home at this hour and spend that time. In relationship, those years go by so fast. And it's so critical for her development and her life. She needs a dad there. And yep, I've got 450 kids on this campus, but I don't need to be dad to all of them. I'm their school headmaster, and that's my role. Right. You know, so yeah, it is keeping balance. And of course, you know, in schools, you need to have visibility as well. So there are lots of school events and that sort of thing. I look for ways to get my family to participate in those as well. But I also know the value of building community outside of the school. You do need a circle of friends. And, you know, whether you're doing that through a club or through a church to build a community outside of your professional community, really important for emotional health and well-being. So I encourage that as well. And I appreciate that because that is so needed. As leaders, people are looking to us to see how we lead our lives, not just at work, but our families. Yes. And so the way we go is the way others may go. And so thank you so much for that, Toby. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to go back in time, what advice would you give the younger you about leadership? Patience. I think as a young man, I was so eager for success and so eager for, you know, kind of making my mark that there were things that ended up, you know, not being healthy for me or for others. You know, slow down and yet stay directed. Again, it comes back to, you know, it comes back to mission values and priorities. You know, it's know where you're going, but be in it for the long haul. It doesn't all have to happen tomorrow. It's more about the how than the what. Does that make sense? How you are as a leader than what you're doing. 
what kind of a man am I? What is my character? What are my values? You know, how am I doing this is far more important. Here's a classic example. It comes out of school research. So you've probably seen this. What percentage of content knowledge do high school graduates retain four years after graduation? And the latest numbers are saying it's three to seven percent. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, we cram all this content down, oh you know, kids' throats and in their minds. What do they retain? Less than 10% of it. But what do they retain? And when I interview anybody and I say, okay, tell me about a school memory, they remember people and they remember how those people were. They don't remember a single lesson, you know, mm -hmm. they don't remember a unit plan. They might remember a project here and there, but what they mostly remember is how that teacher was, how that administrator was in relationship to them. Right. So that is the most important element, is how we interact with our students, how we interact with parents. That's what's most important. You're absolutely right. I mean, when I think of people that have had an impact on my life, I think about how much they valued me, or yes. I also remember those who devalued me. Yeah, yeah. Now, last question, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners that we haven't addressed? In a day and age where it's harder and harder, I think, to work in a school setting, there's so many challenges that are going on. There is no greater opportunity. I still believe it. If you're passionate about changing the world, you know, or having impact on the next generation, this is where we do it. There is nothing more strategic than a school setting to invest in what the world looks like in the future. So if you care about what human society looks like, if you care about the future of the world, this is where we do that work. This is where we change it. So I would just encourage anyone who's listening to encourage others to come join us on this, you know, really what I believe is the most significant work on planet Earth is what we do every day on our school campuses. I absolutely agree. And Toby, I want to thank you so much for adding value to me and to our listeners. It's been so much fun. Oh, thank you for the opportunity, Lily. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hello, leaders. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.